Good morning, everybody. This is uh, the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, we're here for 24-0521, Ordinance of Estimates for the fiscal year ending in June 30th, 2025. Uh, this morning, we're joined by the fine folks at the Baltimore Development Corporation. I will turn it over to you to introduce your team and uh, give us your presentation. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Colin Tarbert. I'm the President and CEO of the Baltimore Development Corporation. Uh, thank you for having us this morning. I am joined uh, to my left by Jeff Pillis, our CFO. Um, over in the far left corner is Kimberly Clark, our Executive Vice President, Chevelle Dixon, our controller to her right. Um, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started. I believe we have a PowerPoint for you. Go to the next slide. Oh, I have it clickered on. I, I'll go to the next slide. Great. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Baltimore Development Corporation, affectionately known as BDC, uh, we are the economic development agency for the city of Baltimore. Our mission is to grow the city's economy in an inclusive manner by retaining, expanding, and attracting businesses, promoting investment, and thereby increasing career opportunities for city residents. For fiscal 2025, um, I think we were limited to two goals. We've got plenty more, but uh, two that I wanted to highlight was uh, first is to host our third annual Baltimore Together Summit uh, and attain approximately 65% of completion for our Baltimore Together Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. Uh, the summit is a gathering that we do once a year. It's free, it's open to the public. Last year we had over 70 different individual speakers and panelists, and we had about 300 people in person, um, another 700 or so tuned in online, which we live, uh, live stream and record. And um, that's an opportunity for us to uh, talk to the public at large, business owners, residents, entrepreneurs, uh, about what we're doing to, to move the city's economy forward. And so we are in year three of a five-year plan and so that's where we come up with the, uh, hopefully the 65% implementation. There's an implementation matrix which is available online which shows you uh, 99 different action items where we are on each one of those. Uh, and we're encouraging people to review that, um, see where you or your organization might fit in and help uh, participate. It's not a BDC plan, but it's really a city of Baltimore plan. Uh, so that's our goal number one. And then goal number two, uh, which you'll see later in the presentation is the relaunch of ETC, which is our Emerging Technology Center, as a venture studio model. Uh, this is our tech incubator. And so we, uh, over the last year, have been um, basically reinventing what ETC is uh, coming into the future. It's, it's been around for um, 25 years. Um, and so it's evolved uh, over time. And so the venture studio model, which is a more kind of narrower focus, but a deeper focus on helping businesses, entrepreneurs uh, scale up is, is the focus um, in, the, in the coming year. Organizationally, we have three services, uh, service 809, retention, expansion, and attraction of business, and service 810, real estate development. Uh, in some ways, these are very much commingled, um, and so uh, these serve to provide the funding for, for our activities. I mentioned Baltimore Together. We also have the Foreign Trade Zone, Enterprise Zone. We issue RFPs for city-owned properties for redevelopment. We operate a number of loan funds. Uh, we also have our very popular facade improvement grants uh, to improve our commercial corridor. So all of that work falls under both 809 and 810. And then uh, 813 is entrepreneurial development. Uh, that is two programs. The one is Emerging Technology Centers, which I just mentioned, uh, that we're kind of retooling and, and moving forward. And then the other is uh, the Made in Baltimore program, uh, which supports over 300 makers, up to almost 400 makers now, um, scaling from, in some cases, their homes to manufacturing spaces. We also operate the in-person store at currently Harbor Place, uh, which is now gonna be open year round. So moving on to the services and the performance measures, um, as I mentioned, uh, 809, retention, expansion, and attraction of businesses. Uh, this is focusing on increasing jobs in Baltimore's key growth sectors. 
Um, those sectors are outlined in our strategic plan. Um, there's about six growth sectors uh, that, we, that we focus on, not exclusively, but, but primarily. And um, it's recommended that the budget maintains at its current, service a le current level of service. Um, you can see the, the targets and the actuals for FY23. Um, companies assisted, um, our target was 123. We hit 124, so pretty much on target. And then in terms of jobs created or retained in Baltimore City, we had a target of 2,000. We exceeded that at 3,450. And our target for FY25, we're aiming to assist approximately 140 businesses and create or retain approximately 1,900 um, business, or jobs. Moving on to real estate development, 810. Um, this is really kind of the single point of contact and resource for anyone interested in, uh, it says major real estate development projects, but we also assist a lot of uh, smaller real estate projects as well through this. Um, in terms of the performance measures, um, number of commercial corridor facades completed. This is our facade improvement program, which you're I think very familiar with. Our target in FY23 was 50 and we achieved 48, so just about there. And then in terms of the value of private investment per dollar public investment, this is uh, whatever city funds are, are invested in a project, whether it be a loan or a grant. Um, our goal in 2023 was to leverage that one to 10, uh, and we exceeded that by one to 11. And then moving on to FY25, the target, we're looking to achieve 47 uh, facades improvements and we're looking to leverage our investment uh, one to a hundred that number's uh, higher as you can see it's ebbed and flowed throughout the years that's really kind of based on <clears throat> the size of the project that we might be investing in so uh, sometimes you know we can do a, a, a small loan for a small project and that might have a lower ratio of public investment um, to private investment but it could be like a very important um, you know, neighborhood type project, and then other times we might be working on a larger project such as Harbor Point or Baltimore Peninsula where um, the investment is, is, is much larger because the investment's much larger. And then our final service is 813, entrepreneurial development. Um, this supports entrepreneurs and small businesses through technical assistance and resources, and this includes the Made in Baltimore program and Emerging Technology program. Uh, it's recommended that the budget maintain at the current level of service. And as you'll see here, we're, we're, we're essentially retooling um, the, the measures for this one. So in terms of made in Baltimore businesses and certifications, we're looking to increase that by 25. So that would be in addition to the current certifications, which is um, I think around 350 or plus. And then in terms of the ETC, uh, we recently hired a new executive director uh, earlier this year, and so that's the launch of the Venture Studio model. And so we're targeting to help 50 businesses in total, although the Venture Studio will probably likely only have a handful of businesses, which is, which is the model uh, for, for that versus an incubator, which is kind of serves more businesses, but at a not as deep of a level. And with that, I think that concludes the PowerPoint presentation. I'm happy to ask, uh, answer any questions that the committee may have. Councilwoman Ramos. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, good morning. Um, <clears throat> Uh, when the mayor's office was here for small minority business development, the Main Street office is there now. And we had a lengthy conversation around the um, what they are planning on doing is to have more people to, to liaison and be up with the businesses di directly. And to me, that is the Main Street manager's job relative to the Main Streets. Um, but also you have people working in East and West that work directly with the businesses on facade improvement and if they need permits or anything like that. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. They're not uh, exclusive to Main Streets, but they- Of course, no, yeah. understood, yeah. right. But they, they can be, a, they're, I mean, on Greenman Avenue, we are definitely having those conversations. Uh, although we're very upset that Louise left and I'm sure you'll find us somebody great to work with. 
But I think that, um, so I just wanted to confirm that that is indeed also something that you, you also do. We do, yes. Great. Um, the second thing is, um, remember last year when uh, my budget request was for business development and that money went right into your program around facade improvement. Do we, and I'm working with figuring out where that's all going, but uh, there needs to be funding for business development on our retail corridors, uh, which means help with build out, uh, initially buying inventory, uh, those kinds of things to try to get our businesses open. Facade improvement is great and all, but that's not what, we definitely need it, don't get me wrong. And we need those develop, business development funding. Has there been, since we talked about this a year ago, has there been any more conversation about BDC's role in creating that kind of program uh, for our retail businesses in, whether they're in Main Streets or not? We, we do provide technical assistance on permitting and other issues like that are city related. So if they had a question about how to apply for a building permit. I need money, money, I need money. Money like for we the need businesses money specifically? For we need grants for businesses or loan products for businesses to yeah. be able to do the initial build out, to be able to be able to, to open, frankly. So, so the short answer is no, we don't have grants for that. We've tried to partner with the state, um, in particular like the Restore program, which I'm sure you're familiar with to match our dollars with those grant programs mm -hmm. because we do not have the funding to provide for grants for build out or tenant improvements. We do have loan products that are micro loans and a little bit larger, but oftentimes the businesses, they may or may not qualify or may not be enough money. And oftentimes they are looking for, for grants mm -hmm. um, instead of taking on more debt. Mm -hmm. um, so if we, we did a number of grants through the base network, which was ARPA funded. Um, and those were more for, those were, some were related to tenant improvements, some were operating expenses, um, but those funds have been expended. So we've, we've sure. issued all of those grants. So if we, if we had grants funding for, you know, tenant improvements um, or things that were not the facade improvement program, we could certainly look at that. Um, whether we do it or the main streets do it or we do it in partnership, we obviously overlap and, and work in a coordinated way with them. Um, that would be an option, or we could also see what the state is willing to do in terms of DHCD. They have business neighbor work, neighborhood works program, and then again, the, the restore program, which we've promoted a, significantly. So we, yes, we ended we up getting it. more than, and we've got a, a good fair share of, of the funding, which was great. Um, and then we've also worked to increase, and you, I know you're familiar, but for those of you who are not, we, with the facade improvement program, we also tried to increase that for like corner properties and some other properties that were more expensive than others, but also had a greater impact on the community. Um, so I think we upped that to, I believe like $50,000 versus the, the 10 or so that we've done, depending on different qualifications. Um, so we're certainly open to it, but our facade improvement program capital funding gets expended like pretty much every year. It's, it's that popular. Right, no, I, I totally understand. And I, my, my question is more, not necessarily do you have the money because I know you don't, um, but can we work together on creating that kind of program where we could either go to the state or even work with the with city and the mayor's office to be able to provide funding uh, for, for this kind of thing because we're, we're not able to get some businesses open if they can't have build out, proper facade, you know, all of that. Um, so I think that there's still some technical assistance and work to be done there, but also like money um, is, is needed as well. And we, and we could certainly help on the research side, looking at like what the standard costs are for fit outs. And there are other groups too working on this. I think downtown partnership and um, Central Baltimore Partnership has been struggling with this with this issue for, for a while now because of the, the building stock, for example, because these mm -hmm. are typically long, vacant, older, not very large buildings. And so the cost per square foot is very expensive when you have to retrofit and code enforcement 
fire suppression. If you're it doesn't going to mean restaurant. we shouldn't do it. It's, we just need to figure yeah, out yeah, how but, to but do it. Yeah, but I think we could, we could give an order of magnitude because sometimes people are surprised at how much a relatively small build out may cost when you sure. factor in all of those. So mm -hmm. we probably could pull some of that data and working with the small businesses as well as some of these other organizations, just give it kind of a sense of if we were to do X amount of businesses, you know, what, what does a program like that cost? That would be great, and I'll uh, look forward to following up with you um, with you on that as as well. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Schleifer, McCray, Ramos, you have any more questions? Um, okay. One more. Yep. Yes. Um, thank you. I uh, we have a growing population of uh, immigrant community growing in our city, uh, particularly Latino. Uh, I know that you've had, um, you know, Spanish-speaking staff. Um, we have a particular issue that has come to my attention in that there really isn't a place, a place, whether it's virtual or whether it's. Um, uh, a building uh, for people to come to who are in the immigrant community to figure out what to do, like getting permits or, you know, uh, what the laws are, um, all of that. And so people have figured it out. We also have, you know, local groups like Southeast CDC and, um, you know, LEDC and others. Uh, but I th I'm feeling like we need to build a network, really, of resources um, and a one stop for our community to be able to say, okay, I want to start a business, I want to do a food truck, I want to, you know, what are all of the things we have to do? Because typically what happens from my office gets the complaints and calls when somebody doesn't do something right. And so I want to make sure that we're being pro more proactive on that. Is that something that you've already started working with? Maybe, me well, I know Mima hasn't been doing it, but I'd like them to be involved in this network um, idea. Uh, is that something that you'd be, you are starting to do or are interested in? So we actually have a, a network, so similar to what you're describing. So the base network, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but I'll send you the information. So since COVID, uh, we put together, initially it was an ad hoc uh, network of 15 organizations uh, led by BDC. We meet every week. Um, they're typically t technical assistance providers or CDFIs. So LEDC, for example, is one of our partners. Um, Southeast CDC is one of our partners. And so that was, initially it was philanthropically funded and that was to respond to COVID. And so we were basically triaging, in that case, like all of the different businesses that had you know, con concerns or questions about how to navigate the different programs. Since COVID, then we transitioned into the ARPA funds, which were more sort of proactive grants to support businesses that were impacted by COVID, that's now ended. Our, funded, our funding's ended. <laughs> but uh, the, the partnership and the community that we built, I think, is, is very strong. And so we were very fortunate to apply in conjunction with Impact Hub, who's also one of our partners and kind of stepped up and helping to do more coordination. Uh, we applied for an International Economic Development Council uh, fellow, which was funded by EDA, which um, Charlotte Clark, uh, we were selected. Charlotte's now on the ground here. And so she's basically in-kind uh, support, so we don't have to fund that position. And so now we're trying to figure out how do we evolve the base network um, without necessarily funding for the partners to participate. Um, and, and that, whether it's in-person, like you mentioned kind of, you know, physical, or whether it's kind of virtual with the opportunity to meet in person, because we've, we've done it that way as well. We want to use the base network as that portal, because as, if you've kind of already alluded to, you know, Main Streets, which is also a network partner, BDC, we kind of all do pieces of the continuum, but there's not like one organization that does it, but together we get most of it. Um, and so originally, um, a business could go on and basically submit, you know, I'm a business, I'm doing XYZ, here's what I need. And then we would triage it on the back end because we would share all the data for that particular business. And then we would assign like a primary. So if it was, in, in some cases, if it was a Spanish speaking business, we might ask LEDC to take the lead or they're probably already working with them in a lot of cases. And then the other partners would be there to fill in the gaps. Um, 
because the grant program was fairly intensive, we kind of got away from just like the day-to-day -day, um, input, but that's something that I'd like to go back to in terms of basically, instead of having to go to 15 different partners, you can just go to the base network. We can help navigate that business through the ecosystem. Um, so, so we have the network piece, which is the hard piece to build. I think what we need to do is get back to the kind of portal system um, and we'll have to rely on the partner's willingness because we can't necessarily fund them for their service. But I think there was a lot of value in it, both for us and for them. Um, so we can definitely follow up and give you a briefing on the base network, what we've accomplished to date and kind of the vision moving forward now that we have Charlotte on full time. That would be great. We'll follow up with you on that. Thanks. Thanks. I knew about the network in terms of, you know, the COVID and, and yeah. all of that. I didn't realize that that was still going to continue, which is a good thing. So I appreciate that you're still willing to do that. So thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Colin. Kim, I want to thank you for being model public servants, for doing more with less. I'm going to miss, for one, during budget hearings, seeing you guys at 9 a.m. every year. Thank you for everything that you and the team at BDC do. Uh, we're now in recess till 10 a.m. Thank you.